Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our Complex Homicide um, monthly webinar. Today's webinar is Civil Justice for Victims of Crime, more so for Victims of Homicide. Um, before we begin, a couple of house rules. Um, there is a Q&A section at the bottom, I believe, of your screen. If you have any questions, please feel free to type any questions to the whole group, if not a uh, personal message to me or any of the panelists. Today's presenter will be Laura Cook. She is the project director for the um, multidisciplinary responses to family community of complex homicide cases here at the National Center for Victims of Crime. For those who don't know, I am Jose Melendez. I am the program manager under this grant as well. So without further ado, I will present, I will pass it along to Laura Cook and she will begin the webinar. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks so much, Slay, and thanks to everybody for being here with us today. So like Slay said, um, we're gonna, it, we took this webinar um, from other webinars and other trainings we've done called Civil Justice for Victims of Crime. But what we're gonna do today, since it's, uh, we're presenting it as part of our complex homicide program, we're going to uh, tie it back to homicide cases as much as I can. And like Sway said, my name's Laura Cook and I work on the Complex Homicide Project. I also work on the National Crime Victim Bar Association. So you can see that logo on your screen. Uh, the National Crime Victim Bar Association is one of the programs of the National Center for Victims of Crime. Uh, the National Center, for those that may not know, has been around for about 35 years. And we got, it, we got started out of one family's tragic event. We got started, uh, there was, some of you may be familiar with the case of Sunny Von Bolau. She was a victim of attempted homicide by her husband. Um, her husband was prosecuted, was found guilty, but then appealed. And upon retrial was found not guilty. And her children felt so re-victimized by the criminal justice system and mind you, this was back in the 1980s before the victim rights movement and before victims really had uh, the protections and the voice that they hopefully do now in, in the criminal justice system. And so out of that frustration, Sonny's children started the National Center. Our goal, and I think a good way to provide an overview of what we do, is to provide education, training, and technical assistance. And we do this through our many programs. One of those programs is the National Crime Victim Bar Association, and the National Crime Victim Bar Association is a group of attorneys, about, a, about 400 or so, uh, throughout the United States. Those attorneys take on cases involving civil, civil litigation for victims of the all different types of crime, including wrongful death. So I'm going to uh, give you a lot of case examples through the training and, and try to relate most of those to some examples where a homicide survivor or families of homicide victims may be able to pursue a wrongful death claim against uh, perpetrators and also specifically third parties that might be responsible for, um, for those criminal activities. A couple of other programs that we have that I want to highlight, uh, our Financial Crime Resource Center is one that I direct. Uh, we provide training and technical assistance to help victims of financial crimes recover. Um, and it covers financial fraud involving identity theft, investment fraud, mortgage lending fraud, mass marketing fraud, and elder financial exploitation. Um, Sway and I both work on our complex homicide project. I know we have a, a lot of the, uh, our, the, a lot of sub grantees on this webinar today. So thank you all for joining us and hopefully this can give you some helpful information. We have a tribal mapping project. We also have a national compassion fund that helps um, in the wake of mass casualty events. When money is collected for victims, we assist in distributing it. And then I, I always try to note our Victim Connect Resource Center at one 855 victim The Victim Connect Resource Center is a resource and referral helpline that will they'll take calls from any sort of victim uh, throughout the country. I believe their current hours are 8 a.m. Eastern to 7 p.m. Eastern. It might even have extended to 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, so they're not a 24-7 helpline, but they can provide resources and information about victim compensation, about victim advocates. So if you get a call from somebody and you're not sure how to help them, it's not really in your arena, and you're not really sure where to tell them to turn, you can always direct people to the victim 
Tech Resource Center, and they can hopefully get them in touch with the right organization. So before we get started, just a quick trigger warning, there's going to be um, discussion of sensitive topics, no photographs per se, but um, I always like to include this as a best practice when we're talking about sensitive things. Okay, so to kind of put things in perspective, we've got two systems of criminal justice, or two systems of justice rather. There's the criminal system and the civil system. And a lot of people look at these systems as, you know, things that they don't really mesh well. Um, however, we think that there are many ways in which these systems can uh, both be pursued, and we really think that they should both be pursued in many cases. Um, so I'm going to highlight a couple of the differences. Most of you are probably familiar with the criminal justice system where we've got um, a perpetrator or the state versus a perpetrator. So the offense is against the state, technically. Um, it's usually a violation of a statute or a state law. Um, the goal of the criminal justice system is to hold the perpetrator accountable to the state. Um, the state prosecutes and controls most of the cases. And the burden of proof is relatively high. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a pretty high burden of proof. Um, lastly, in the criminal justice system, the successful outcome is usually some sort of uh, accountability in the form of a criminal punishment like restitution, probation, jail, or something of that nature. Now, conversely, in the, in the civil system, in the civil justice system, we're talking about um, lawsuits against um, lawsuits from the victim against the individual who is responsible or perhaps a third party. Um, it's usually a violation of a common law, so a lot of the, the laws that civil justice relies on when pursuing cases um, aren't written in statutes. Lots of them are common law violations. The goal in the civil justice system is to hold the defendant accountable to the victim. So we usually have the victim or a family of the victim uh, pursuing that litigation. Um, in the civil system, the victim initiates the lawsuit and they control many aspects of the case. The evidentiary standard is a little bit lower than it is in criminal justice. So it's a preponderance of the evidence. Um, the best analogy we can give is a, a little bit over 50% likely that the perpetrator should be held accountable. So it's a little bit lower than the criminal justice system. Um, and we highlight this because if something, if a prosecutor decides that there's just not enough evidence to prosecute something criminally, that doesn't mean that it can't be prosecuted or can't be pursued civilly. Because that burden of proof is a little bit lower, there's a chance you could pr pursue something in civil court that might not be um, advisable to pursue in a criminal in the criminal side. And then lastly, in the civil side, the successful outcome is monetary compensation. So civil side is not going to hold anybody criminally accountable um, by putting anyone in jail or anything like that. The, the end goal is to get some sort of monetary compensation for the victim or the victim's family. And we highlight this because, you know, a lot of people, the first question they ask is, well, how, you know, how, are, how am I going to get any money from this perpetrator? And it's a very good and valid question because in, in law school, they talked to us a lot about, well, you, there's no sense in squeezing juice from a turnip. You know, there's no sense in filing a lawsuit against somebody that does not have any assets. And that's true, but what a lot of people don't realize is that there may be other entities that are accountable, or there may be other ways to get judgments. Um, if you can get a successful judgment for the victim, there may be ways to collect that judgment um, beyond just getting money from the perpetrator. And I'm gonna talk to you all about that today. I wanna highlight a couple of benefits um, for civil justice. So indemnification, you know, getting that financial compensation for the victim. Uh, the criminal justice system can get restitution, but it's, it's limited. Um, a lot of, if you have property damage, you can get restitution. You may be able to get restitution for specific things, but you can't get restitution for something like pain and suffering. And when you, you're dealing with a violent crime, homicide cases, those pain and suffering damages can be pretty extreme. So in the civil justice system, you can, can sue for pain and suffering. 
accountability is a big benefit. Um, a lot of times when people go through the criminal justice system, um, even when a perpetrator is convicted, victims don't always feel like they've gotten that sense of accountability because it's, you know, the state versus the perpetrator. Uh, the perpetrator may just go to jail. There might not be any restitution. A lot of times the victim doesn't feel that the perpetrator has been held accountable to them. And so what we try to do in the civil justice system is help them get that sense of accountability by taking control and having a say in uh, the litigation process. It, civil litigation can also provide answers, you know, why, asking why it happened. You know, in the criminal justice system, motive can be something that is, you know, related to the, the crime or related to the, the litigation, but it isn't always, and there's not always a clear answer. And with civil litigation, and the discovery that can be done. Um, if we can't get victims answers in the criminal justice system, our hope is that we might be able to get them some answers in the civil justice system. That sense of control is a big one, and I, I've talked about it a couple of times now. Letting, uh, having victims be able to make some decisions about the case is, is really important because when people are victims of crime or family members of a, a victim of a crime, they often feel that they don't have any control of the situation or over their lives. So helping them to regain that sense of control is, is really helpful in the recovery process. Um, the civil litigation system gives them their day in court, a sense of personal justice. It can also provide incentives for crime prevention, um, economic incentives, We'll talk a lot about negligent security. And so just a quick example of a negligent security case. Say you're staying in a hotel and somebody breaks into your room um, and causes an injury. And they were able to break in because the hotel does not have adequate security measures in place. Um, that hotel could be then accountable for the injuries that you sustain. Uh, if that happens, uh, what the hope is, if we're able to file a lawsuit against that um, that hotel, that landowner, we hope that they will then put security in place so that that doesn't happen again. So the whole idea is, if you're going to be, if, if there's a chance that you could be held liable for something, as a business owner, you're going to want to do whatever you can to prevent crime from happening so that you're not going to be held liable in the future. And then lastly, um, one of the big benefits is promoting change and publicizing issues. You know, some of you, you've probably seen um, lots of, there's been lots of lawsuits after um, uh, clergy abuse. So we have a lot of attorneys that focus on child sexual assault cases. Um, and there's been a lot of publicizing those cases so that churches and religious organizations and many organizations are now putting measures in place to, uh, pre to prevent this from happening in the future. Um, that publicizing and, you know, having that be out in the media just kind of gets the ball rolling a little bit faster. So there are a couple of disadvantages. Civil actions can be expensive. Now, typically, attorneys are going to take these cases on a contingency fee agreement. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's basically, if you've ever heard those ads saying, there's never a fee unless we get money for you, that's not like a special advertising gimmick. That's how most attorneys, uh, particularly working in personal injury litigation, that's how they operate. Um, most attorneys are going to consider taking things like contingency. So this means they kind of have to do uh, a cost-benefit analysis, look at what the injuries are, who the parties um, that might be liable for those injuries are, determine what the chances of them winning a lawsuit are, and what the chances of them then collecting a judgment after the, the litigation ends. And they have to weigh that against the cost of pursuing the case uh, because cases are costly to uh, do filings and do discovery, um, and then just just time. It can take a long time. They weigh those those costs and benefit. They kind of do that cost benefit analysis and determine whether they can take a case on contingency. 
Victims might be subjected to uh, like re-victimization if they have to keep talking about what happened to them. So it's not for everybody. If, um, if people don't, if a victim doesn't want to continually talk about what happened to them over and over and over again, it may not be the best option for them. Um, and it's something we always want to let people know about this before they start to file, um, start to go through the litigation process because they are going to have to tell their story a lot. And we don't want to re-traumatize them while, uh, while we're encouraging them to pursue civil litigation. Civil suits can be slow. They can take years. We have, we've seen cases that last two, three, five, even 10 years. So it can be very, very long. And that's a good thing for people to know up front as well because um, they should prepare themselves for the possibility that this could take a long time. And then if perpetrators or third parties responsible don't have assets, civil litigation may be, not be a good option. And I talked about that a lot, doing the kind of the cost benefit analysis and trying to figure out if there are people who might be able to pay a judgment if we go through the whole process and are able to successfully get a judgment. So who does the victim sue? There are a number of first party defendants including the offender, co-conspirators, and, and, and accomplices, and also potentially parents and supervising custodians. Um, you can sue offenders. There are wealthy people who commit crimes, so that there's possibilities of suing perpetrators of crime for certain. Uh, co-conspirators and accomplices, same thing there. It really depends a lot on whether they would have any assets, whether you want to include them, and how, how much they were involved in the crime. And then lastly, the parents and supervising custodians. State law varies a lot um, in regards to whether you can include parents and supervising custodians. Even if they did nothing wrong, in some states they might be liable for actions of a minor. And typically you'll see parents and supervising custodians being liable in cases where a really small child uh, commits a crime. So if a, a really small child gets a hold of a gun and shoots somebody, if the gun wasn't locked up um, correctly or if the safety wasn't on, if it wasn't secured, parents may be held liable for that crime in civil court. Um, with older children, there's there are some states that uh, will hold parents and supervising custodians liable for certain things. But that's really something, um, it, it's very dependent on the state law. So that's something you'd have to look into if you're dealing with a case of a child committing a crime. We also can file lawsuits against third party defendants. So there are landlords, hotels, hospitals, merchants, sports or concert venues. Often those cases were filing for inadequate security. So the hotel example I talked about before. Um, if they don't have security and they should have had security, or if they should, if there's been crime there before um, and they didn't put any security measures in place to prevent that in the future, they might be able to be held liable. Perpetrators, employers. There's a thing called respondeat superior. It's a Latin term just basically saying that um, an employer might be liable for things that employees do within the scope of their employment. There's also, we're going to talk a little bit later about negligent hiring, supervision, and retention. And then social hosts and tavern keepers for liquor liability. So if people are overserved um, at a bar, um, if they're overserved at, a, at sometimes a, a house of an acquaintance or a friend, and then go out and commit a crime, um, they're driving under the influence and cause an injury, they may be able to be held liable. Social host liability, so if somebody gets overserved at um, a private residence, that differs a lot state by state. Uh, tavern keepers, so being overserved at a bar or other types of venue, um, that's most states have some sort of liability for overserving patrons. A couple other third party defendants, uh, mental health officials for failure to warn. So in this case, um, one example that we use in all our materials is a case uh, in 
I think it's regions versus California. And it kind of set the standard for these types of cases. What happened in that case was that there was a psychologist who was uh, caring for, in this case, what, what happened to be a perpetrator. The perpetrator said to the psychologist, um, you know, I'm having homicidal tendencies. I'm really upset with this person and I'm, I'm going to go and hurt her. And the psychiatrist, uh, assuming that there's doctor-patient confidentiality, did not warn uh, the person. The perpetrator in that case did go out and commit and kill the, the victim. Um, her parents were able to sue the university the psychiatrist worked for because in that case, there was a credible threat and an identifiable victim. And under those circumstances, psychiatrists do have to warn people. Um, if there's a credible threat, if they think the person who's saying they're gonna do something is actually going to go out and do it, and then an identifiable victim. So if we're pinpointing one specific individual um, or a small group of individuals, you know, can't be just general homicidal tendencies, but if it's focused on an identifiable victim, there is going to be a duty to warn on the part of the psychiatrist. Um, corrections officers. So the, with the government, I'm sorry, that's next, I'm jumping ahead. Corrections officers for release of a dangerous person. If a person is released, they know to be dangerous and that person goes out and commits a crime, they might be able to be held liable. Um, or if a person escapes. Uh, government. So government, there's not always a general duty. There's got to be some sort of special relationships. Um, government has special relationships to people in custody, such as prisoners, detainees, and children in foster care. Um, if there's an affirmative pro promise to protect somebody, the government may have a special duty, like somebody in a victim, uh, like a victim in witness protection. And then if there's a criminal protective order or civil restraining or order, liability might be established if the order was violated in the presence of law enforcement. One thing to note with government uh, liability is that there is, government does have sovereign immunity. So generally the state is immune from liability. Um, an important thing to note, so you can't just sue the state for, there are many, many exceptions as to what you can sue the state for. Um, if you are going to file a lawsuit against the state, usually there's very strict notice requirements and you have to give notice um, pretty quickly after the crime has occurred and sometimes you've got to give that notice within about 30 days or so. And lastly, there are federal constitutional claims. For those of you that might be uh, familiar with Title IX, you can file lawsuits based on discrimination in universities, and Title IX has been used to file lawsuits specifically for sex assault on campus. So if somebody is sexually assaulted and there aren't proper policies and procedures to help that person and provide them accommodations, the universities can be held liable under Title IX, particularly if they receive uh, federal funding. Okay, any questions so far? Like Sway said, please go ahead and type them. It's a lot of information. We usually do this seminar, uh, do a longer seminar, and so squeezing this on to 90 minutes is a lot, and I'm happy to answer questions as we go. So switching over a little bit, not really switching over, but you know, let's we're gonna start talking about what these what these offenses are actually called. And basically this falls under tort law. So um, towards its common law, and it's just a legal term for a civil wrong. The definition is not super important, but um, in law school, everything we're talking about pretty much falls under tort law, tort law class that we all take in our first year. So there are different types of torts. There are intentional torts, and then there's negligence. So intentional torts require the person who committed the act to do so deliberately. Intentional torts are more comparable to crimes like battery and assault. Battery and assault are crimes, but they also can be intentional torts. Whereas negligence is just the failure to use proper care, which results in damage or injury to another. So this is where we see lots of third parties being held accountable. Um, while they're not 
intentionally committing a crime, they're failing to use a proper duty of care. Because of that, somebody gets injured and then they may be able to be held liable. There are a couple elements of intentional torts. There's always an act. Um, there's got to be some kind of intent because it's an intentional tort. Uh, there's causation. And then also there's got to be some sort of damage. So there are different types of damages. We have compensatory damages, um, which basically compensate the victim for loss. And then we have punitive damages. Punitive damages are, you know, in addition, it's kind of to punish the perpetrator or the third party. Um, a good example of punitive damages, some of you might be familiar with McDonald's coffee case. Um, and that case made, uh, there's tons of media attention about that case. Um, I've watched documentaries and I learned a lot more about it since hearing about the what happened in the case and learned basically that the damages in that case, one, one of the reasons the damages were so high was because the jury decided that they couldn't just hold McDonald's accountable for the injury, the medical cost for the victim that had spilled the really hot coffee on herself and caused pretty severe burns. The medical costs were high, but McDonald's is such a huge corporation, they, they didn't think that would really send a message. And so they awarded a lot of punitive damages and they actually calculated it. The punitive damages that they awarded was the amount of money that McDonald's makes selling coffee in just one business day. So it was a lot of money, but in the grand scheme for McDonald's, it really wasn't a lot, but they did feel like they needed to give the victim some sort of additional compensation in that case uh, because of what happened to her. So a couple examples of intentional torts, uh, battery, assault, wrongful death is one we'll, we'll focus a little bit more on today. Uh, fraud is considered an intentional tort, anything related to the domestic violence, and then lastly, stalking. So those are some examples. Battery, I um, want to highlight differences between, between battery and assault just quickly. So battery is like an unwanted touching. Uh, a harmful or offensive physical contact without consent. It's usually done with force or violence. Battery usually includes sexual battery, molestation, forceful sodomy, and lots of sex crimes. Whereas assault is a threat or an attempted battery carried out by the threat of causing bodily harm, um, together with the victim's perception that the aggressor has the ability to cause harm. So with an assault, you actually don't need to commit a battery. It can just be a threat of battery. The good thing to know when we're talking about torts, though, um, going back to elements, there has to be damages. So if there's no damage, if there's just like an assault threat, um, you probably are not going to be able to pursue a case in civil court. So there's a couple affirmative defenses. Um, many of you have probably heard of the self self defense defense but there are others as well. There's consent. Um, consent comes up a lot in sexual assault cases where the perpetrator alleges that victim, the victim did consent. Um, Self-defense comes up a lot. Defense of others can be a, def a defense, but usually it's an incomplete defense. Um, it depends a lot on the, on the state law and it depends on the relationship from the person who is defending that other. And then provocation is another uh, incomplete defense. Provocation can be used um, to basically say, well, I did this because I was provoked. However, it's never gonna be a complete defense. It might, you might be able to downgrade the degree of the crime a, a little bit. Um, like for instance, from um, first degree homicide to third degree homicide or something like that. So negligence torts are a little bit different because there's that we're missing that intent piece. So there's a, there's more um, more nuances to it. With intentional or negligent torts, there's got to be a duty of care. So there's got to be some legal responsibility between the individuals that a reasonable person would have foreseen. That foreseeability uh, aspect is 
is important and it can it can be difficult. There are some things that are more clearly foreseeable, but then there are also things that, well, maybe it's indirectly foreseeable, but um, and and state laws differ on that as well as as far as what is foreseeable. Some examples of a special relationships where there where there is a duty um, as like a parent and guardian. A parent or guardian has a special relationship um, to whatever child they're they're caring for. Another example is an employer employee relationship. There's a, a, a extra duty of care employers owe to employees. For negligence, there has to be a breach of the duty, so failure, um, failure to use the appropriate standard of care required by law. Um, there has to be causation, so the breach of that duty has to cause the damage. It was foreseeable that the breach would, res breach would result in damage, so that foreseeability aspect. Um, and then damages, so there has to be some sort of actual injury. Some examples of negligence-based torts. We have uh, negligent hiring, retention, and supervision. You're going to see a lot of these in the employee-employer um, aspect. So negligent hiring, hiring somebody that has um, a criminal record and not checking um, to make sure, doing a background check before hiring them. For instance, if we have a daycare and they hire somebody, you fail to do a background check, and a background check would have revealed that that person had um, had a, a, a had a charge for child sexual assault. If they hired that person and that person then did commit an additional child sexual assault in the workplace, that employer would would be liable. Negligent retention. So, say you forget to do a background check uh, during the interview process, but later on you realize you didn't do it. You do the, the background check later on, see that charge pop up. Um, if the employer then fails to fails to fire the purpose or fire the employee who has that background that might negatively impact their job, and that person then does go on to commit another related crime, an employer could be guilty of negligent retention. And lastly, negligent supervision. Um, employees have a duty to supervise, employers have a duty to supervise employees to some extent, depending on the scope of their work. So that's really job related, but you know, for instance, take the daycare situation again. If you have somebody, uh, a younger person, maybe for example, supervising um, minor children, that that minor himself is going to need some sort of supervision. And if you fail to, as a, if an employer fails to provide that supervision, they may be able to be held liable if something happens as a result of that failure or that breach of their duty. Here, there are a couple others. Negligent entrustment is an interesting one. So negligent entrustment is um, entrusting somebody with a dangerous instrument. Um, for example, I think I used the example earlier, um, a child who gets a hold of a gun because it's not um, properly secured or locked away. If, for, if a parent would, would provide a young child with a gun, would entrust them with this dangerous instrument, and they would go out and then cause an injury, um, parent may be liable under a theory of negligent entrustment. We have an adequate security, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier as well. So basically just failure, the failure to have reasonable security measures. Um, reasonable security measures are very dependent on the circumstances. So things like sufficient lighting, security guards, metal detectors, and working locks are all things, all examples of security that should be in place in various um, businesses like hotels. Um, the inadequate security piece is also sometimes contingent on the criminal history in the area. So if it's in a high crime area, um, you usually have to have a little bit more security measures in place um, versus an, an or, an, a business in an area where there's not been any criminal activity um, because there's no notice that criminal there might be criminal activity, the business might not have to have as many of those security measures in place. Failure to protect personal information. So this one is more related to fraud. Um, 
if an institution like credit reporting companies or banks fail to protect your personal information, they may be able to be held accountable. Negligence per se is basically there's if there is a statute that there can be statutes that say um, we have just that a state enacts and decides basically if there's this sort of negligence um, that whoever breached the duty is going to be able to be held accountable. So states can put put these uh, enumerate negligence in state laws, um, and when that happens, it can be known as negligence per se. And then lastly, alcohol liability. Alcohol liability, we talked a little bit about um, social hosts and tavern liability. Um, so cases where people are overserved and then go out and drive under the influence and commit a crime, um, those are cases where we um, may be able to hold an establishment accountable under a theory of negligence, for example, for overserving a patron. So a couple wrongful, de uh, wrongful death cases that I want to highlight here. Uh, the first one is uh, discusses a little bit about an intrafamilial murder. And in this case, um, the two victims were murdered by their son and the court had to decide what was going to happen with the parents' estate. And ultimately, this was before any Slayer statutes were in place. Um, if you're not familiar, Slayer statutes basically say if you commit a murder, you, can, you can't profit off of it. So if um, in the case where a child murders parents, they can't, they can't um, come into any money through their estate. Um, you can't publish any books related and get money from those. So some states have slayer statutes, others do not. And the slayer statutes vary widely, but the whole concept is to not let murders profit from those crimes. So prior to a slayer statute being enacted, um, the courts kind of had to decide what to do in this case. What they decided was that the victim who murdered his parents would not be able to profit from that wrongdoing, and instead that inheritance was passed on to the perpetrator's children or the grandchildren of the deceased. The case of a driving impaired uh, homicide where a 20 year old was very intoxicated and crashed a car, killing two passengers. Um, she was charged with many counts of manslaughter and was um, found guilty and sentenced. Um, and the families of the victims filed a lawsuit against uh, the bar she visited prior to the incident for over-serving her. So when these things happen, any sort of driving impaired homicide, it, it really is good to talk to an attorney. Um, the reason is because most um, in a lot of these cases, there is car insurance that can be used to cover damages. So we always talk about, we talk about wanting to make sure that there is um, some sort of way, if you are able to get a successful judgment, for that judgment to be paid. Um, and in driving impaired homicides where there's, where there's car insurance, usually insurance can be included or insurance companies can be included in lawsuits. Um, and typically, there's some sort of coverage that can be paid to the families of victims in those cases. And then the last one, um, an example of a, a child homicide where a perpetrator killed his ex-wife and child um, and then did publish. Um, he actually, they, they thought that he had or rather he said that he had gotten the idea to do it from a book. And they actually tried to sue the uh, the publisher of that book um, under civil conspiracy conspiracy theories. In this case, they weren't able to be successful because um, of various um, various First Amendment theories, saying you know there's you can't hold the publisher of a of a novel liable for committing a crime. So there's definitely you can't just sue um, anybody related to the crime. Um, there are definitely organizations that are more likely to be held liable, like um, tavern keepers, bar owners, hotels, motels, landlords, whereas like a book publisher, even if it inspires a crime, it's probably unlikely that they're gonna be held liable for it. 
So we talked about some affirmative defenses to negligent or to intentional torts. I want to talk about a couple affirmative and uh, defenses to intentional torts. So the first is comparative negligence. Um, there are many different models about comparative and contributory negligence, and they vary by state. Um, but essentially, it just means if um, the victim participated um, or contributed to the the negligence and was you know contributing in the the incident, that they may not be they they're the perpetrator may not be fully accountable to the victim in this case. There's also assumption of the risk. So um, if you see signs, you may see signs places you go where, you know, um, you know, there's a risk. If you do this, you assume the risk. Um, and in those cases, you know, if you're doing something inherently dangerous, you're, there's usually going to be some assumption of the risk there, and you may not be able to um, pursue any case based on an injury under a theory of negligence. And then there's um, also workers' compensation bars. So if people are injured at work, a lot of times they will pursue workers' compensation. If people do pursue workers' compensation, they may not be able to pursue um, a, a civil lawsuit under a theory of negligence. And just to highlight, the, the top of the slide says affirmative defenses to intentional torts. These are affirmative defenses to negligence we're talking about here. So that's a typo error on my end. Sorry about that. So statutes of limitation, we always want to mention because they are so short. So statutes of limitation basically give a timeline for when um, a civil action can be brought. Typically, statutes of limitation range from two to five years. Um, they differ by state. They differ depending on the type of um, tort, if it's an, an intentional tort or if it's a negligence claim. They can also differ depending on the type of tort. So um, sometimes we'll see fraud being a little bit longer um, versus like an assault or battery would be two years typically. They vary widely. Every state has exceptions to general rules. Um, some of those exceptions are discovery rules or repressed memory rules. Um, a discovery rule basically is just saying, here's this picture here that kind of helps. The discovery rules are apparent, or something that happens a lot in medical malpractice cases. Um, basically, it's the, the concept that you can't uh, start the timer for a civil lawsuit until you discover the injury that was caused. So in medical malpractice cases, sometimes um, objects are left in patients after surgery, and a lot of times they don't discover that's there uh, until after, until a while after the uh, surgery has taken place. So we don't want to start that timer until the victim discovers that injury. Um, the statutes of limitation are also often told for minors and those who are disabled. Um, and then the most important part of the statute of limitation information is to just consult an attorney sooner rather than later. It's always better to talk to somebody sooner. Um, at, at best or at worst, they can say, oh, you know, it turns out we can't file anything right now because of these things going on with the case, but we'll do this to preserve the statute so that you're not um, out of luck when that time runs out. Okay, so say we've gone through the whole process, pursued a criminal lawsuit, um, have gone through discovery, pre-trial, had a trial, the perpetrator is found to be liable um, for, the, for the injury caused to the victim. Um, the end result then is what we then have to do is figure out a way to satisfy that judgment or get the perpetrator or third party to pay the victim. So there are a couple ways to do that. Wages can be garnished. Um, some states actually have forms that can be sent to employers so that they know that uh, some of their wages are supposed to be garnished and sent to a victim to pay a judgment. Um, there can also be liens against pensions, so benefits can be affected. Um, there can be dispersals from trust funds, royalties, and even rent. 
So if people are getting other types of income, um, there may be ways to get dispersal of money to the victim from those funds. I have the son, the son of Sam law. Um, so basically, if you're if you're if you come into money um, and you um, you owe money through a judgment, then you may have to pay that out. We saw this happen in a case where there was a homicide of um, it was a homicide. The perpetrator went to jail. The perpetrator actually suffered was a victim of a crime in in jail. Um, the perpetrator was able to successfully sue file a lawsuit against the state in that case. Um, because of the injury that occurred to him while he was in jail, he came into a good deal of money. So the victims of the person that he had previously killed went to an attorney and said, he's coming into all this money, can we do anything? And they were able to successfully pursue a lawsuit against him um, and get some of that money that he had come into as a result of his injury to pay for the previous homicide that he had caused. Um, tax refunds and government entitlements can sometimes be used to satisfy a judgment. Credits against property settlements. Um, and lastly, windfalls, like inheritances, civil judgments, and even lotteries. We have had cases where um, perpetrators come into money through the lottery, um, and previously a civil case may not have been a good option, but if they come into a lot of money, there may be cases where a civil uh, civil case is a better option after that happens. Um, some other sources, and uh, these are things that attorneys will look at when they're deciding whether they can take a case on contingency. So cars, boats, jewelry, other possessions that are very valuable, real estate, business interests, uh, bank accounts, financial holdings, and other debts. So there are lots of sources and lots of ways judgments can be paid. So before we kind of wrap up a little bit, I'm going to talk about um, insurance policies. Insurance policies almost always have some sort of exclusionary clauses. So typically, um, something related to crime victims, exclusionary clauses uh, exclude liability. Basically, insurance companies are not going to pay for intentional crimes of others. So if somebody commits an intentional crime and has a homeowner's insurance policy, homeowner's insurance policy is not going to pay for that intentional crime. However, um, insurance companies do usually cover negligence. So we had uh, two interesting cases where we were able, attorneys were able to get insurance coverage for things. One of them was uh, a sexual assault case. It was a sexual assault on a college campus. Um, it, it was two, in, uh, the perpetrator and victim were both intoxicated. Um, they went to uh, prosecutors and law enforcement and they basically said, you know, there's not enough to prove uh, beyond a reasonable doubt here in this case because of the nature of the crime, because of the circumstances of it. And so the victim pursued a civil action against the perpetrator. Because the perpetrator wasn't held criminally accountable, it wasn't considered uh, intentional, it was more considered negligent because he was also intoxicated. And so they were actually able to include and get coverage from the perpetrator's parents' homeowner's insurance policy. Because although the, the crime happened on a campus, the perpetrator's primary residence was his parents' um, home and thus he could get coverage from that policy. Um, another good example, we had a case um, where there were five perpetrators um, who participated in the homicide of a victim. Um, with After investigation, it was decided that the way it kind of went down was they there was one gun, they had all touched the gun or held it at some point, and then one of those perpetrators actually did pull the trigger and caught the homicide. However, the attorneys in that case decided that they could potentially File a, file a lawsuit against the other participants who held the gun because, um, because, they, um, because it was negligence. They actually never pulled the trigger, um, but they could be held accountable uh, under a theory of negligence and were able to include some of the, the parents' homeowners insurance companies 
under that uh, in that case. Okay, so we have, let's see, a couple other insurance things I want to talk about. Automobile insurance. Um, we, when we do these seminars, we always tell people to check and make sure they have underinsured or uninsured insurance coverage in case you get in a car accident with somebody who doesn't have insurance. Um, car insurance will typically cover cases involving driving under the influence of some sort. Homer's insurance, I gave those couple of uh, examples. There's also uh, umbrella insurance, commercial liability insurance, professional malpractice insurance, and med pay. So you as service providers are you know, really the cornerstone of increasing awareness. Um, we want you all to know about civil remedies so that you can refer victims to qualified counsel um, and you can refer them to our association, the National Crime Victim Bar Association. We have attorneys throughout the country that we have vetted um, that have experience in these cases, have experience working with victims, know about being victim-centered and trauma-informed when they're doing this representation. So the, the idea is to get people in touch with an attorney that has experience, you know, understands um, and has worked with victims in the past, um, who has a network and this network of attorneys can be really, really helpful. They have colleagues that they reach out to. We have conferences and trainings so that they know, um, so that they can talk about the cases they have and new techniques and strategies that may be helpful. There are a couple techniques that we think victim attorneys that take cases on behalf of victims of crime um, are familiar with. So there's Jane or John Doe filings, particularly used in child sexual assault cases where um, these, a lot, most cases are public record, um, but if a victim doesn't want their name on the case, they, can put, they could potentially file it under a John or Jane Doe. Um, Confidentiality agreements can be used on both sides, and sometimes it's used to the advantage of perpetrators, but you know, often the victim doesn't want a lot of the information that may come up in a civil suit to be open to the public, and so confidentiality agreements can be used. You can put filings under seal so they're not open to the public, and there's limitations to all of these things, but these are some techniques that can be used. And then video depositions are often used, particularly if we have children testifying. There may be ways to have children do a video deposition so they don't have to go into a courtroom um, and, and sit in front of a perpetrator and testify. So I have our number up here for um, the referral service. It's 1-844-LAW-HELP. Oh, I'm seeing the email is wrong. I think the email address now is attorneyreferrals at victimsofcrime.org. It is on our website, um, and you can always reach out to me or reach out to Josue if um, you'd like a referral or like to know more about it. Some other resources we often give people are state and local bar associations um, and also legal service organizations. Uh, if, they're, if people are low income or they might be eligible for legal services through a state legal service organization. We have lots of resources on our website. It's uh, www.victimbar.org. We've got um, civil justice for victims of crime pamphlets in many states. Um, not every state just yet, but we have a lot there. And we also have Spanish versions of a general pamphlet and some Spanish versions of state-specific pamphlets. Those um, can be printed and given to victims. We also do have some extras at our office and can sometimes provide those if you'd like them. You're welcome to reach out to me. There's my email there at the bottom. My name's Laura. Um, Benjamin was unfortunately unable to be here with us today, but um, you're welcome to reach out to me with any questions you might have. And I don't know, I'm not seeing any questions on my question board, but if you guys do have questions, now's a great time. I'll hang out for a little bit longer. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.